Hello, podcast listeners. Are you a fan of sketch comedy? If not, turn off this podcast and engage your parents in a meaningful conversation. If you are into sketch comedy, this episode is for you. We take a deep personal dive into sketch comedy and what belongs on the sketch comedy Mount Rushmore. Sit back, relax, enjoy this episode of JJ Meets World. And by the way, if you'd like to help support our podcast, visit jjmeetsworld.com where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some killer swag at our merch shop, or click the link to Apple Podcast and give us a five-star review. One, two, three, four. J.J. Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always snipping out his next adventure. Yes, he is. He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. J.J. has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called J.J. Meets World. Hypothetically, mm-hmm. if you had to pick which cast member of Kids in the Hall is the greatest cast member, if you mm-hmm. had to pick, why is the answer Bruce McCullough? Oh, interesting. So it's funny because I just started watching their new Amazon series, which, by the way, has way more full frontal male nudity than I was expecting. <laughs> Have you watched any of it no, yet? No, but that that's awesome. Right out the gate. And you <laughs> think like, Wow. Because I think that there's an argument that each of them bring their own thing, right? And right, I, watching right. the first two episodes, I'm like, you know, I why hasn't Scott Thompson done more stuff? Because that dude is sort of a chameleon and like can roll into everything. Um, Bruce McCullough had an amazing album that came out, I think, in 2001 called The Drunk Baby Project. <laughs> And it's impossible to find now. Like, it's not on streaming services. Like, I don't even think I found YouTube. Like, someone had put it on YouTube. So I had to jailbreak an old iPod so I could get it off of there and put it onto, like, Is it available on compact disc? Even finding it on CD is tough because it wasn't really well received at the time. Okay. (laughs) And it's a mixture of, like, these song sketches. So, like, for example, the first one is about the drunk baby project where the Canadian government and it's like, you know, like the drunk baby project in 1975, the Canadian government. And it talks about how they had a fund to get a bunch of babies drunk to see if anything would happen with their cognitive ability going forward. And the idea is that Bruce McCullough was one of the drunk babies. But what I think is the best sketch out of all of them, and it has nothing to do with the other kids in the hall, it's just his own solo project, is called uh, Sucre Papa, which is French for sugar daddy. Sugar daddy. <laughs> and he he uses his old man kind of voice, and there's like, oh, Sucre Papa, pay my rent. He's like, I already paid your rent. <laughs> And it's going back, and it's like, I want a parrot, a parrot. And it is genius. It's the perfect mix. I always thought of like the fact that, you know, in Canada, they have to put everything in French because it's yep. their second official language. Yep. And of course, they call it Sucre Papa instead of Sugar Daddy because it's got a like a fun little Canadian twist to it. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite kids in the hall like character that Bruce McCullough played oh. that really made you think like this is the, this shows off one of the reasons why I think he's the best? You know, it's hard for me to say. I mean, the thing that's been in my head lately are these are the Daves I know. Mm-hmm. I love these are the Daves I know. Um, David Atmans works it, at my dad's store. <laughs> it's There's something intangible to me about Bruce McCullough where, I mean, I love, let me, don't get me wrong. I love every member mm-hmm. of Kids in the Hall and it's not Kids in the Hall without one of those members. They all need to be there. Everyone there is brilliant in their own way and they're, they're, they, they round it out in this amazing chemistry. Bruce McCullough, though, as just a performer, Mm -hmm. feels very singular to me. Um, He can just affect a look on his Mm -hmm. face that makes me laugh. And it's it's all it is. It's even just the the intensity with which he'll look into the camera and his commitment to what he's saying and doing. He has a level of performance commitment that is hard for me to describe. So it's to me, it's some kind of an intangible, but he just 
stands out to me. And so to me, he's the greatest member of the company. I feel like each of them kind of came to the table with a different, you know, like, do you play a great straight man or do you play the one that's just completely off the rails? Right. And Bruce McCullough was always that person who could play completely off the rails. So even if he's playing like a suburban dad who's packing the car, you know, he's the suburban dad who has like blueprints for how he's going to pack the yep. car just right. Uh, I do you know I've actually talked like I email back and forth with Kevin McDonald. No, I told you this. No, so four years ago, I'm gonna say I got an email unsolicited from Kevin McDonald saying, Hey, listen, I live in Winnipeg and I would like to come to Fargo and do some comedy shows. Would you be willing to team up with me to do these shows? No and shit. then I could teach like a workshop and do these really? kind of things. And I was like, that sounds awesome. And he's like, okay, great. And so he goes, give me your phone number. And so I gave him my phone number. And then I got a call like 10 minutes later from Kevin McDonald. No shit. And I had to, I had to tell him like, listen, I need to know that this is you. And I'm, I'm not being like <laughs> pranked. And he goes, uh, how you do that? And <laughs> my response was like, uh, could you do your lady voice? <laughs> From kids in the hall, and he goes, "Oh, do you mean this voice?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my god, I'm talking to Kevin McDonald." Uh, and so the plans for that particular one fell through because uh, venues were hard to come by down here for it. But we started emailing back and forth and back and forth, and so I ignite well, that idea in his in his brain. Well, and he, he lives in Winnipeg, right? That's a hop, skip, and a jump from here, and he's looking to do stuff. Can you imagine and, getting him and Tobo here oh, at, the at the same time. time. I'm actually working on getting uh, Tobo and Julie Haggerty. To come to town. Now, do you know? Do yeah, you yeah, like, yeah, yeah. From yeah. Uh, airplane. Yeah. I really um, want to get Jennifer Tilly to come to town. Too. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Let's figure that all this stuff out. So Mark McKinney needs a shout out too because yep. Mark McKinney has done a done bunch of stuff outside of Kids in the Hall that I'm really impressed with too. Namely, he's plays Glenn, the manager, in a show called Superstore on NBC. If folks, if you haven't watched Superstore, not only is it just hilarious, but it's the best show I've ever seen at handling the pandemic. Mm. So it all takes place inside of like a Walmart or Costco type store. And it's the people who work there. And Mark McKinney plays Glenn and he plays it with his really high voice for five seasons. <laughs> real high like this. And he's super religious and his wife can't have children because she's got a corkscrew uterus <laughs> as he explains. <laughs> Uh, but they, <laughs> yeah, they, they foster like 70 kids. And so there's always Glenn's like kids showing up. Um, and the character is just, it's so funny. He's like, he's like, uh, there's one night where they get locked in the store. He goes, how about we sing a campfire song? He goes, he goes, cry Ezekiel cry. And he <laughs> And you're like, I've never heard this song before. He must be making this up on the spot. And he loves to drink juice and finds out he's got like diabetes <laughs> halfway through the season. But what's genius what's genius about Superstore is the pandemic hits and they rewrite the season to be about the so it's almost like what's the perspective of the Walmart worker? And so they do a whole season where they're all wearing masks while they're like working with stuff. Uh -huh. Um Ruben uh, Ruben Fleischer, who did the uh, the Zombie Land movies, mm -hmm. is one of the executive producers uh, on it, and it's just I mean I'm telling you it is start to finish friggin' hilarious. Uh, the, the the side characters that they create, wow. I think the only other like show I've ever seen that creates as great of side characters who become main characters was The Office. Okay. Um. So, but his like his stint in that is great. He also has a very awful sketch. So he was on Saturday Night Live. Mark McKinney is one of the few kids in the hall, you know, who had like a Saturday Night Live presence after uh, they finished working on uh, Kids in the Hall, and he does this awful sketch the last time that Chevy Chase hosted, where Chevy Chase is the weatherman for a local news place and he's buying a paper from a, like a street vendor and again mark mckay goes is like hey you know i saw it so from channel four he goes you ever talk to the channel four chopper and he goes the the helicopter he goes oh that chopper is just amazing i would give anything to see the channel four chopper so the the character is obsessed with the chop with the yes. helicopter and it's somehow, not a bad premise to play oh, yeah. off of but it somehow it makes five minutes like okay yeah and five then, minutes is 30 seconds, maybe. Right? And it ends with like that spinning graphic of a newspaper that's like local man steals chopper, you know, channel four, the channel four chopper. 
And uh, it, I, that's the only sketch that I can remember him in. Period. Now we haven't. We need to mention Dave Foley. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, he's had probably the biggest career. I would say out so of, yeah. out of all of them. He's also had a ton of really awful personal problems in his in his married life and and oh really i didn't know there's that. um you should listen there's some old there's an old podcast of him on the joe rogan show before joe rogan was like the biggest podcast in the world and he details his whole divorce story and and what he's gone through and it's Aww. pretty it's pretty harrowing it's pretty bad um so i'm really happy to see that he's like out and working still and doing stuff he's the one who i always thought just didn't seem to fit like but, like but he's, in the he's right the, way though, right, yeah, right? exactly he's, he's hilarious but he can also he's the perfect straight man yeah he's so good and in that he's not he's always he can always support the joke 100% and he's that makes it sound like he's never being funny he's being funny all the mm-hmm. time and it's the chemistry of him with those guys you put dave foley in another cast probably doesn't work out but see now in the I, way that it does it with this right. one at least so i'm going to disagree with you there because i think dave foley is the chameleon who works with every cast so like oh, okay news radio he's a you know and he's supposed to be the straight man in that, you know what? that that's a very good point right and he's You're awesome. totally right and then i saw him live at the fargo theater because he was part of the who's live anyway okay. so it was he joel murray Greg Proops and Ryan Davis together and he fit in just perfectly with those guys. Okay. He always, he always seems just a little bit classier than everybody That's else. True. Right. Like yeah. the sort of thing where like, if the cops were to bust a party, they'd be like, eh, no, sorry, sir. Sorry to bother you this evening. <laughs> I love in how, in all the Daves I know and the yen, they just add Dave Foley yeah. in without even really, Wait, that's Dave Foley. That's why he's there. <laughs> but that he's just there. And I think his performance in that ending spot is perfect too, because he's not he's drawing just the perfect amount of attention. You know, uh, I recently went back and rewatched somebody keeps putting stuff in our break room at work that they're getting rid of. So like once every like five months, someone will bring in 30 books huh. and be like, oh, I'm getting rid of some books. I mean, so if anyone's getting rid of VHS tapes. I, oh, well, that's the thing is someone snagged a Jurassic Park VHS and I was going to get it for you. And someone <sighs> got it before I had a chance to go put my coat down. That's right. But someone yeah, but- stupidly gave away the entire Kids in the Hall series on DVD. And so I immediately yeah. snagged that. Who just gives that away? I know. What a moron, Ugh. right? And is that even available on Blu-ray? I don't think so. So it's pretty much yeah. Just, but you can get it on digital now. You can get it stream. So, um, and I think that you know the thing that works out best for them is they don't have musical guests, so you don't have to worry about yeah. the licensing rights for that type right. of thing. But there is a, there's a lot of stuff that is just perfect. I mean, still like we're talking thirty years later, and it's just brilliant. But there is some stuff that did not age as well for them that at the time was groundbreaking. But nowadays you just can't make that particular joke. Okay. Um, a lot of stuff, you know, with homophobia uh, that at the time, like I said, was groundbreaking. But today I think people would be like, nope, you went you went too far. Mm-hmm. Like, you you know, you marginalized a group of people. Um, but it comes down to this. I love their movie Brain Candy. I think it's one of the best like it why didn't SNL look at brain candy and say oh this is what we should be doing with our movies it's not one character we follow through the whole thing it's multiple characters right. that we can follow doesn't Lauren Michaels produce kids in the hall he does in fact here's an interesting fact for you so everyone talks about how Dr. Evil in Austin Powers is stolen from Dana Carvey's imp- Mike Myers stole Dana Carvey's impression of Lauren Michaels right I disagree with that because right. Brain Candy, the main like bad guy in it is this guy who uh, designed a drug called Stummies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he is Lauren Michaels. Like, is the, it Mark McKinney? It's uh, it's Mark McKinney. Yeah. And he goes, because he's playing that character in the trailer for the new kids in the he hall. Is, right. And so and because he plays into this, it's. I'm going to give away a little bit of the beginning of this series because I think it's fucking phenomenal. It's a, a character played by Scott Thompson who you think might be sort of just this old hippie and he's having a yard sale and someone comes and they find kids in the hall on VHS, like brain candy on VHS. And she's like, how much? And he goes, he goes a dollar. And so she buys it for a dollar and then like the heavens open up and he goes, kids in the hall brain candy has finally made back its budget. (laughs) He goes, the curse is lifted. (laughs) 
So that's how they come back to life. Yep. And after that, that's amazing. <laughs> um, but it's just like, I, I know that there's a gag right in that first, like in that first sketch when they talk about like, I've got my best man on it. When you watch it, you're going to lose your crap. You know what that makes me think of? Like the, the feeling of kids in the hall makes me think of doing Trouble News at Noon. Yeah. And 3,600 seconds back when we were at, at Trollwood doing video production. Just the idea of you're hanging out with your friends in the summertime making goofy videos because you don't got anything to do that day. Like that's just like the that's just the purest form of joy for me. And watching them, I feel like I'm seeing them do that. Right. Like even though they've got budgets and crew and they're famous like that, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a bunch of buddies get together and make stuff, you know, and, and they're you know, they're clearly. Um, you, you, they have to be, if they're, if you're going to make like a, like a Mount Rushmore of sketch comedy troops, I mean, I think Monty Python and kids have to be in there no matter mm -hmm. what the two oh, of yeah. them are guaranteed a location. So if there's only two more after that, then I mean, do you do Saturday night live, even though it's like a, it's more of a franchise that has a bunch of new people coming into it, or is it too big and too much of a, its own variety show? Versus like a, a core sketch comedy troupe. I mean, let's face it. Without Saturday Night Live, you don't have kids in the hall, sure, right? Right. I mean, so I think that you've got to include it. It can be lower to the bottom just because it has kind of lost a little bit of that edge. Right. But but it's I, like, like, how would you take the Simpsons off of a Mount Rushmore right. of, of TV cartoons? Right. right. You wouldn't be able to take SNL off. You're and right. like. You know, if we so kids in the hall is technically international, right? Because it was produced sure. for Canada originally. Right. And so if you look internationally, Great Britain, uh, aside from Monty Python, has got some great sketch comedy troops like Little Britain is another one that I love. Uh, Man Stroke Woman is another one that is sort of like. It's perfect because the sketches are filmed as a single cam mm -hmm. and they they just have beginnings, but not necessarily an ending. You know, it's where Nick Frost got his big start. Mm. And, you know, they've got things like there's a, a sketch where he and his wife and it's just I mean, it's maybe 30 seconds long where the wife is on the phone and she says the vet said that you need to read the instructions like I think I know how to feed a dog and he feeds the dog and you're like, you like food, don't you? You're a good boy, aren't you? You're a good boy. And the dog explodes. <laughs> And then he goes, uh, very Monty Python. -esque. Yeah, I need to look at those instructions. Right. So, OK, here is a potential candidate to go in this list. Are you going to say cards. Mr. Show? No. Oh, the Muppets. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, does my personal like opinion go into that? I mean, they've got some amazing stuff. I mean, the the format is there, right? You've got a, uh -huh. an ensemble cast that's performing sketches as a troupe. Yep. Right. Um. And 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 so these are skits that we're seeing them do. Mm. Um. And I mean, ah, uh, you know, part of me. I mean, I I, but I love you know putting weird things on there. But I think there's a there's definitely an argument to be made. I think there's definitely an argument to be made that they should be included Yeah, in, in the conversation, at least. Yeah. You know, that definitely, I mean, I wouldn't call that a sketch show. I call it a variety show. Sure. But it's a, a, a every variety show. Cause like, I also think the Carol Burnett show right. probably belongs on this list. Right. Because you're talking about a female led comedy troupe that, you know, has surpassed generations. Okay. So, okay. Then, then, so there's clearly so many that belong in the conversation of greatest of all time. Mm -hmm. But if we had to do a Mount Rushmore, meaning you can only pick four, four, that is it. It seems to be that, okay, from a historical perspective, I think you need SNL and Monty Python. Yep. There's just no way to not have them on. Mm -hmm. So then it really is, what are the other two? Mm -hmm. What are the other two? I don't know the answer to that. Is it SCTV? See, and so, you know, and SCTV is great and fantastic. There are some that just represent a certain era. Right. 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 And then there's a difference between like a live sketch show and a taped sketch show. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is a huge aspect to it. And there are things that only lasted for a small amount of time that I think do deserve a lot of attention. But are they the best? Is SNL the only live one we're thinking of? No, uh, Mr. Show opens with a live uh, that's taped. Uh, a lot of that stuff was taped like okay. with a live audience. But it was was it broadcasting live? 
No, no, no. Yeah, SNL would be the only one that actually is live, live on live. the air. Yep, yep, yep. Got it. Um, God, this is a this is tough because you got Upright Citizens Brigade. You've got yeah, Mr. Show. Really tough to not look at Mr. Show. Um, obviously, all of these happen because you get SNL and Monty Python. Mm-hmm. I don't think you get SNL or Monty Python from the other one. Mm-hmm. I kind of feel like they were like. Yeah, basically they inspired different things. They inspired right? different things, and 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 they sort of maybe create the two main pillars of the sketch show genre, mm-hmm. right? One that's fully absurdist and pre-taped, and one that is live and and broader more more often than not, yeah. right? But one that is a variety show as well. Versus Monty Python's not a variety show, right. but SNL has that aspect to it. It's, it's funny we're talking about this because I just finished Bob Odenkirk's memoir, Comedy, 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 Drama. And he talks about being part of the Second City and then getting hired at SNL and hating every minute he mm. was working with SNL. And like Al Franken being needlessly cruel to him. That's and, crazy. Uh, and it ends up that he like he ended up having this amazing scam with SNL where he's like the last season I worked on SNL I really my heart really wasn't in it and I was offered a job doing this like main stage sketch show with uh with Second City and so he would be in Chicago Wednesday or doing the show Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday fly to New York on Saturday and walk around the halls for a couple hours so that it looks like he was there and then (laughs) fly back to Chicago for like the Sunday show. And he did this for like a year. Was he just writing? Yeah, just a writer, just a writer. And so, uh, but that's what birthed, you know, uh, Mr. Show. Right. And later on, whatever, Bob and David, I think was his. The Ben Stiller show. Yeah, you can't forget the. It's like it's only one season, right? I mean, the Dana Carvey the show, Dana too. Carvey show, the Tracy Ullman show. Are we even going to talk about Mad TV? Like <laughs> Mad TV, I totally forgot about Mad TV. Right? We have to, though. I mean, it's necessary because it would be. Did the, you ever see the show Fridays? Fridays was like uh, I think it was on Fox. It was Saturday Night Live, but it was on a Friday. But that's where Michael Rick- Richards got his start on Fridays. On Fridays, oh, was that where Andy Kaufman did the whole? Andy yes. Kaufman was on that yep. show. Mm-hmm. Okay, I just found a. Uh, uh, it was just on YouTube somewhere. Someone had found an old VHS tape of <laughs> called Sunday Night Live, and it was for a Christian youth group oh. like thing. And oh, so boy. it's the two pastors and they're doing skits and it's uh it's pre-taped stuff and it's all shot on VHS plus some live stuff. And uh let's just say it's it's the funniest thing I've seen when it comes to sketch mm-hmm. comedy, if you know what I mean. So there's Sunday Night Live. We can't forget about that organization as well. You know, to some extent the Dean Martin show, it was another mm-hmm. variety show, but it had a lot of sketches that were a part of that. Johnny Carson had a bunch of sketches. Yeah. But I mean, okay, so there's but I, I think I think that one is a we call that one a talk show, right? Yeah. So it's a talk show that has sketches sprinkled into it. Right. Um, same thing with like Conan. Right. 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 Yep. 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 So I think. OK. So Monty Python SNL. Yep. Those two I, are I on think there. we're going to flesh this out before the end of this episode. OK. We're going to come to some list. So who who are viable candidates for that you really think are viable? Kids in the Hall, I think, is a viable candidate. Mm-hmm. Um, now, let's go based off of this. Let's talk about. OK, let's. T- Let's talk about straight up commercial success, right? Because right. maybe that is a uh, part indicator. of the puzzle, right? Kids in the Hall uh, ran for six seasons, I think. Uh, and then it had a movie. Mm-hmm. And then it had the mini series Death Comes to Town. And now is being revi- has been revived by Amazon. Right. I think that that's pretty huge, right? It's pretty massive. I, I, I think that you have to add that. I think you also have to add... Which a uh, heart, it's an intangible, but it's fan devotion. Mm-hmm. The the level of the amount of posts I was seeing from celebrity comedians about how excited they were that Kids in the Hall was back showed you how their careers were inspired by Kids in the Hall mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. So Kids in the Hall is a really strong choice. I also think SETV is a really strong choice because of who was involved. Right. And they spanned a the movie as well. They yeah. had the Strange Brew, the uh Bob and Doug McKenzie movie with Dave Thomas and Rick Moranis. Right. So, so if they were in, if they were Mount Rushmore, that means Canada's got two. Yeah. Right. Which is very interesting. Yeah. Canada two, America one, 
Great Britain won. Now, some other options. I think Mr. Show is is in the conversation. Yeah. Again, it's something where they are super devoted fans, but that is definitely more obscure. Right. Right. So sure. it was on HBO, so it wasn't on network television. Right. And it was a little hard to find. Um, I don't think we ever got a Mad TV movie. And it's weird because I feel like Mad TV, when YouTube hit, had this boost Mm -hmm. because you didn't have to sit through 60 god awful minutes to watch the five that actually were good whatever had will sasso in it is what you're probably looking for you know that or uh oh god why can't i remember the name the girl who did like that like hi i'm glanda and Mm -hmm. or stewart the the, the stewart skits right um and you know there were a lot of talented people who went through mad tv at one point or another that was, I think, clearly just character based, you know, right. like it was who the big character was at that time. Yep. And that was about it. Um, and they would really I mean, SNL does this, too, but and Mad TV would really beat a dead horse. Yeah. As much as they could. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I remember seeing Jim Carrey early on in Living Color. Right. Why have we talked about, we it in, talked Living about Color. in Living Color? Um, because it just wasn't as big as the other ones, but I mean that spawned a lot of careers too. It and not only that, but like that one has a special place because they said we are performing to a different audience. Yep. Like we are going to tackle sketch material that appeals to uh, entire swaths of the population that mm-hmm. have never had a sketch show that involves like their daily lives. It was in Living Color Fox as well. It was so Fox and Mad TV had or, or, or Fox had Mad TV and Living Color at the same time. No. In Living Color, I feel like ended like in the l- mid 90s. I don't even know how many seasons they did. It was like three or four. Maybe tops. Something like that. And like they had the Fly Girls. Jennifer Lopez, I think, was one of the Fly Girls. Okay. And like so the, the dancers. Um, and then Mad TV was like maybe a couple years later. And what's interesting about Mad TV is it was supposed to be Mad. Like it's Mad Magazine, right? Mm-hmm, right. And they quickly gave up on anything related to Mad Magazine. The, in, the animated interstitial stuff like that. They were just like, oh, never mind. We'll do our own thing. Right. It's a funny uh, brand. And so we'll use that to launch right. this thing. Now, maybe maybe we talk about this. Fox may have been the sketch comedy king because in Living Color, the Ben Stiller show. That was Fox. That was Fox. I thought that was, for some reason, I thought that was Comedy Central. No, I don't. I don't think Comedy Central had existed yet. Okay. And certainly not enough to do like a big thing like right, that. Right. Um, it, it was either in my head, either Comedy Central or MTV, but it was Fox, huh? Yeah, and then okay. Ma- and then of course Mad TV. So I mean, they've put some effort into sketch comedy series, trying to find it because you're looking. I mean, you want your sketch comedy series to be a feeder, right? Like it's who's going to be the breakout star from this that we can turn into, you know, the next Ace Ventura, or mm-hmm. who can you know we can sign for the studio. Mm-hmm. Um, to you know, let's talk about Comedy Central too because Comedy Central. Uh, Inside Amy Schumer, I think, was on there, right. which was a fantastic sketch comedy show. UCB. They did some good stuff. You, the Upright Citizens Brigade, for Holy sure. Holy shit. How have we not said Dave Chappelle? Chappelle oh, show. Oh, Chappelle show. That might be one of the spots on Mount Rushmore. Yeah. It might be. It's in the running because mm-hmm. of its cultural impact. And it was only two and a half, not even three, se- yeah. two seasons, basically. Um. And the drama outside of the show itself right. also, you know, gives it, into like, this was important. It's so intrinsically tied, obviously, to Chappelle and his career for obvious reasons. Um, oh, man, that might be one of those ones that had a massive impact. And because of that emotional push, could get it onto a lot of people's Mount Rushmore's. Um, but like Key and Peel mm-hmm. does a lot more in that format. And I don't agree with Chappelle when he said that they stole his his formula. It's like, right. no, that's bullshit, dude. Um, Key and Peel is 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 utterly brilliant. I think we ended up with an era where absurdist comedy really became like king, mm-hmm. and I love that. I mean, you would have to say Robot Chicken is a sketch show as well. Mm-hmm. It's animated, but it's a right. you know it's a sketch show right. to boot. I have to say this. I am definitely putting the Carol Burnett show on my Mount Rushmore. Okay. It it has to be up there for me. I think that's a show that it did spawn a spin-off television series with Mama's Family. Mhm. And I will still watch that thing and laugh and laugh and laugh just as hard. And 
when I hear about the, I just listened to a book on tape that Carol Burnett did about making that show. And mm-hmm. I am just in awe of the talent and the resources and the things that they did to make that. The Carol Burnett happen. show probably has the most famous blooper of all time. Right. With uh, Conway doing the story about the Siamese it's, elephants. Right. Who um, sneeze. Who sneeze. And the multiple takes they try to do. And you've got Dick Van Dyke like falling to uh-huh. the floor in hysterics because he can't hold himself in an audience, which is completely uh, just uh, possessed by what's happening in that moment. I think it's the first time we ever saw people like break and then not be able to recover because right. it's so f- like they are so entertained themselves. And I think America, you know, I, I hate when they do that on Saturday Night Live. Like it's it's amazing when it used to be so incredibly rare mm-hmm. that someone would break that you'd know it's amazing. There's a great blooper from I think the first season of SNL where Candace Bergen is hosting and Gilda Radner comes on. She's like, 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 hello, Fern, how are you? And she's like, I'm good. And she's like, I'm thirsty. And she goes, well, here, have this glass of milk. And Gilda Radner pours the milk into her purse. And she goes, that milk's not too good. I'm still thirsty. Well, it's because you poured it into your purse, you see. <laughs> and she goes, ha. Huh. And so it's for the National Association for Stupid People. <laughs> And she turns to the camera and she goes, we all can't be brainy like Fern here. And Candace Bergen loses it because she there that must have been totally unscripted. Right. Uh-huh. Like where you just went a little bit off and did that thing. And then I see, I want to put SCTV up there, but they're like. While some stuff is timeless from SCTV, there's a lot of stuff that just was a representation of that era, right? Mm-hmm. Like the Jerry Todd show. <laughs> Have you ever seen any of those? Mm-hmm. You're starting to look a little like Jerry Todd right oh, now. Great. You got to see. Awesome. Uh, but it's a Rick Moranis character where. So he's, Jerry Todd looks like young Santa, basically. Yes. Is what you're saying. Yes. Got it. Got it. Uh, but he has like like a like the old school like video switcher device in front of him, and he he produ- produces the Jerry Todd show. Hey everyone, how's it going? Star wipe here, and <laughs> it's mainly about him producing this like show and showing you all the stuff. And he's like, "Can you believe it?" And then he'll push his hand while the wipe is going. Who past. plays him? Rick Moranis. Okay, and it's. Like he's sitting at this desk and you can't see his whole torso because the machinery is so big in front of him. But it's the type of thing where if they ever decided to revive that, Jerry Todd would be producing a YouTube live stream like they were just ahead of their time. I think even though I have seen almost no SCTV, I might even put them on my Mount Rushmore because of who is involved. John Candy. Rick Moranis, Catherine O'Hare, Eugene Levy. Are you fucking kidding me? Mm -hmm. These are the most. Catherine O'Hare is the best actor, uh, female actor on the planet, in my opinion. Um, And so like just Rick Moranis. Are you kidding me? John Mm -hmm. Candy. Come on, man. Like that's insane. And that's a better cast than Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd and Gilda Radner. And those are legends. Mm -hmm. Absolute legends. And I think the SCTV cast was better. Um, so they may go on my Mount Rushmore having barely seen any of those skits. The SCTV cast also has an interesting story where they were allowed to make this television show, but they weren't making it in New York City. They were given access to a studio in Edmonton. Right, right. <laughs> and so in Edmonton, Canada, they're like, hey, we're famous for really only one thing. SCTV was shot here, but they were allowed access to everything. So you could go like if you needed uh, if you're doing a sketch about like a pothole like uh-huh. filler, they would just call the mayor's office and say like, hey, do you have a pothole somewhere that we could shoot at? And they're like, sure. Yeah, here you go. And I think that that was pretty interesting how they would go there and just write. There's an amazing story that Rick Moranis talks about where he was going to do this sketch where he was going to play a butcher. And it was just like a fake little commercial because the premise of SCTV is that it's a network that's so small that their entire week's programming fit 
into like a two hour slot. Got it. So they had fake commercials. They had promos for things that didn't exist. And so he was doing this butcher commercial and he went to their makeup person who, by the way, their makeup and costumers for this thing performed miracles because when Dave Thomas plays Bob Hope, he looks just like Bob Mm -hmm. Hope. And Mm -hmm. it's not just his impression. It's his look as well. And he tells this uh, uh, makeup artist, he goes, could you make me look like a pig, like a man pig who owns this butcher shop? And she's like, well, yeah, if I've got a picture of a pig. And so he goes to the <laughs> library, gets an encyclopedia that has a picture of a pig and brings it. <laughs> she had to go get a picture of a, a pig, pig somewhere. Because yeah. <laughs> she would, you know, she had to work off of right? like, okay, yeah, so and I'm thinking like- that they don't have the internet yet. That's right. And so, uh, and she had to get there extra early. So like he had to pick her up in a blizzard at like 6 a.m. so that they could get this makeup done before the shoot. And Dave Thomas comes in. And he sees Rick Moranis in this makeup. And he goes, I have got to be a part of this. I need to be a part of Could this be two brothers? And so they rewrite the sketch right there where it's two brothers who own a butcher shop who both look <laughs> like pigs. Like they're men, but they look like like enough where if you were just walking by real quick, you'd do a double take. And these characters ended up being something they wanted to revisit at one point. And they did a deliverance parody. Mm. And they said, I'm going to make you squeal like a human. <laughs> And uh, yeah, just brilliant stuff out of SCTV. Do you think we get kids in the hall without SCTV? No. Okay. That might be the argument right there then is that we're looking at historical um, um, importance as well, right? Mm-hmm. Like where do lineages start? Because you, S- you don't get SCTV without SNL, right? Probably. Right. More right. than likely. Yeah. Maybe. A hundred percent. Because Second City said we're sick and tired of Saturday Night Live stealing all of our people. Got it. We want to monetize part of it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So, so I mean, maybe the Mount Rushmore is SNL, Monty Python, Carol Burnett, SCTV. That's not a bad one. It's not. Not at all. It'd be hard to I argue mean, with it. I think the thing that is hard to say, like, okay, was there not any good sketch comedy after, like... 1980 because really we're putting snl on there because it was a uh it was groundbreaking right Right. and it was a trailblazer right but like i don't include like current snl amongst it right i mean i I think it's more or less if we're thinking mount rushmore you know those presidents have been dead for a very long time Mm -hmm. right we're not adding faces to mount rushmore and it'd be difficult to make an argument for anyone since then because just of the the foundational level that those four particular persons in history did um and so yeah i mean i just think it, it makes sense that it would be the ones that that blazed a trail right and there's you can always look at generational things too like if you need to make a secondary one of ones that don't fit under that because in eras have passed so you you know then you're probably looking at like a kids in the hall mr show upright citizens brigade you know and something else that would go into that secondary one um, it's weird because like you take Mark McKinney, Amy Poehler, the people who started their career on another sketch comedy show mm-hmm. that's highly regarded, but really it was their stepping stone to, you know what we didn't talk about? Let's talk about the kids based one, all that on Nickelodeon, right? Because all that also defined a generation of kids who that was their first step into sketch comedy. Yeah. Now let's say here. Okay. Here's a different question now. Mm-hmm. So let's say. You're omnipotent, right? And you get to build, let's call it a, let's call it a four person cast uh, of uh, using anyone who has uh, had a career in sketch comedy okay, from any era. Okay. You can pluck them from history and you're going to put them, you're going to match the four of them together. Um, Who who do you build that, that team out of? Uh, It's going to feature Amy Poehler. Yep. uh, John Candy, just for my personal vanity. And I think he can do just a little bit of anything. Um, I think that you're going to have, um, I think you can have Jordan Peel. Ooh. I think Jordan Peel is solid. A choice. chameleon. Like he can yeah. play the straight character. He can play the over the top zany character. So I think he'd be a good mix in that. Yeah. And then if I, wa- I want to put another female in there so that it feels balanced it's probably going to be Catherine o'hara yep yep Mm -hmm. i i think i would only swap out one for my own which Mm -hmm. is probably john candy with bruce mccullough sure um it's probably how i would swap it but i'm with you 
100% of the way. What an absolute killer team that would be. Right. Wouldn't that be fun you, to you watch? You would think. You would hope, right? Maybe you don't know. Maybe it turns out that they would be poisoned. Like, we all hate each other. We all hate each other. Right? I want to play that character. I would just, I mean, if it, even if it was just Catherine O'Hara and Amy Poehler, just the mm-hmm. two of them together, I'm in. Right. You know, I have a big problem with Saturday Night Live and the guests that they choose because sometimes I think they get a throwaway guest and it's become so much like talk shows used to be people not coming on to promote stuff. They right. just had fun people who are going to be on. Right. So right. if you're going to have Don Rickles on the Tonight Show, it's not because he's coming to tell you about CPO Sharky. It's you want to book a show with great you know, guests and comedians. Right. Um, and nowadays I feel like every time someone's on a show, it's, they're there to promote something. Right. Um, and that's unfortunate because the same used to be for Saturday night live and the right. Muppet show for sure. The Muppet show used to take a lot of heat because some of their guests would be like, they're like, you book this. So there's a famous French flautist <laughs> who they booked as the guest. And I remember like a bunch of American markets were like, what the hell are you doing here? And they did a reverse version of like the rats, uh, the Pied Piper of Hamlin with where mm. you pipe the rats out mm-hmm. where the rat and like, I remember the rats complain and they're like, why are we always the one that everyone's talking about? And they're like, all right, we'll fix it. And instead of piping rats out of the town, he pipes all the babies out of the town because the babies <laughs> are all eating everything. And then they play the song ease on down the road from the whiz. Yep. And I'm like, this is blowing my mind. Yep. Um, but uh, I I definitely think that the era of having a guest on who just fits the bill rather than they're promoting something. So here's an example. Selena Gomez was on right last weekend, and she was there because the second season of Only Murders in the Building comes out at the end of June. So it's a great opportunity to bring like Martin Short and Steve Martin in as like you right. know little cameos because she's got a show that's there. Um, Natasha Leone was the host this last weekend and I, on the last episode of the season and I look at that and I'm like, was she your best choice? And now I've only seen one sketch, so I don't know if she was great on the show, but like, where's the opportunity? Like, why aren't you bringing Carol Burnett? Mm -hmm. One of the highest rated shows they've had in recent memories is when they had Betty White host. Mm -hmm. And what was great about that is they brought back all these female comedians from SNL past who kind of say, well, Betty White was one of those people who trailblazed uh, for funny women. And I thought that was a great idea, but like there's a ton of people who would be hilarious hosts that you're only giving time to because of, you know, something that they've got to promote. And that drives me nuts. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Agreed. It, It almost makes it makes me go. It's an argument to take SNL into its own category or any show that isn't just a solid troop. And the troop is what's making the decisions mm-hmm. versus SNL, which is a corporate structure with Lauren Michaels making decisions. And then there it's, it's, it's not just a sketch show. It's also a talk show variety show that's promoting a bunch of other shit. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's also an advertisement at the same time. And it's live um, versus, you know, the other, the other ones are just constructed differently. Kids in the hall and Monty Python and SCTV. These are like troops of performers who are, coming together and like figuring this out as a, as a whole versus having this sort of like top down approach, competitive approach that I've heard so much of at SNL where like the writers are just trying to cut the legs out from under each other because they're trying yeah. to get their stuff on the air and they're trying to compete. One thing that there's a couple things that SNL does that drives me insane. One is because no one memorizes their lines. Everyone's looking at cue cards off to the side and the eye line is you can't fake it. So it, you can tell they're, they're looking off to this cue card the whole time, and it completely tears me out of what's happening in the moment. I understand that, hey, that's tough. How are you supposed to do this week after week? But if you're the guest that week, like, no, get an idea of what you're supposed to say. Yeah. And then just figure it out from there, you know. Or, hey, maybe build more rehearsal time into your into your week, right? And if you're like, yeah, this show, this, this skit isn't quite hitting, but let's just keep rehearsing it. Maybe we'll get a better version out of it um, versus, like, uh, all the pre-tape stuff. Uh, that you know Python does, and and then they can really mm-hmm. write the episode as a whole, versus going, oh, it's a variety show. We got to plug things into. I feel like SNL feels more like a variety show than it does a sketch comedy show. They certainly have um, the you know the music breaks, and so I did a really amazing the day after I got engaged. <laughs> I was like, hey, there is a special 
uh, touring exhibit at the Museum of Moving Image in Chicago, and it's Saturday Night Live. And the the whole thing is you walk through each day. And mm, so there's a replica of nice. like Lauren's like desk, and then they've got all the costumes nice. and stuff. Yeah. Oh, it was so and it took like four floors and then it ends with you walking through a replica of the studio eight H door. And then you get to sit at the weekend update desk. It's friggin. That's fantastic. Awesome. And so you walk through that and you really realize like the chaos that goes on and how important it is to have a guest host who goes along for the ride. Right. Um, I think of guest hosts that have really impressed me because they either brought their own comedic style to it or they completely like put themselves in the hands of the uh, the the writers. I want to say like the Zach Galifianakis, the first time he hosted where they did the like Daryl's house sketch. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that one? I think so. Yeah. Where it's him taping a local community access show and he's talking to like his controller who's off camera and they re and so they actually do all the edits and so they show the same sketch at the end but with those edits so they take the live tape and I was like that is amazing. Um, John Hamm is another one mm. who I feel like whenever he does that he's like yep you tell me what I need to do yep. and I will do it. SNL this is this other thing where they've got a guest that you can tell is a really unfunny guest and so to try to make them funny. They pair them up with one of their funny cast members who already has a popular character. And then that celebrity comes in and does an impression of the popular character as like a sibling of that character yeah. or some other person. Like who's Dwayne of- the Rock Johnson did Mr. Peepers. Exactly. Yep, exactly. And because like they just they're not funny. Yeah. And so you have to, you know, make it somehow read and make them feel like, oh, this has been tested, market tested. We already know that this character reads really, really well and, and does this sort of thing. And you've already seen the shtick. So do that version of the shtick. And you and you being a celebrity doing the silly shtick, that'll carry you across the finish line. There, uh, in the comedy, comedy, comedy drama, there's a great uh, little thing. He goes, the three things that like are the pillars that if you can get two of these things into your sketch, you're guaranteed for it to at least make it past the table read. And one of them was like, write something specific for the host, uh, write something that is topical to that particular week. And I can't remember what the third thing was, mm-hmm. but I, you know, he hate, he literally hated his time so much that Bob Odenkirk just rails. And even like when he's like talking about being successful with better call Saul and he's like, he's like, but then you look at the shit that SNL is doing. <laughs> I got to read, I got to read this book now. It's so good. Tucker, it honest to God it. is so good. It's can I borrow it from you? You got it. Like Sweet. it is this great like map of, you know, comedy and like, and then when he got offered the role on breaking bad and he's like, Oh, well, are you sure you want me? Like, um, oh, now, okay. So now does Tim and Eric belong in this conversation? Tim and Eric awesome show. Good oh, job. I think that it does. Cause that is a new defining variation, right? They took, you don't get them without Monty Python or kids in the hall. Right. But they completely so, redefined it and, and made, found a new voice, right? Yep. They have a very specific voice that is singular. So you also don't get them without Mr. Show because Bob <gasps> yeah, Odenkirk. Yeah, you're right. Yep. Did, did I tell you the story? We, we, we just told me this like a week ago yeah, on yeah, this yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. Like, and so Mr. Show is, and then you don't get Mr. Show without getting, uh, you know, I'm sure some stuff that HBO did at one point where they're like, well, we need some comedy. Right. <sighs> Soon tight. Thank you. So I I don't know like at one point uh, are they Rolling a sketch Stone, show? They're a sketch yeah, show, aren't they're they? They're definitely a sketch show. But is but what is it just surrealist? Then you'd call it surrealist yeah. sketch comedy. I think that's the best way to describe it, right? Because it is unlike anything you'll ever see before. And I mean, it's it's there aren't jokes, right? It's right. specifically it's it's a comedy effect. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's we're going to continue to repeat this phrase over and over again. And the two of them are able to get it to a place where they could say pizza boy, pizza boy. It's the story of pizza boy. And they could just continue to repeat that phrase. And after hearing it 20 times, it starts to become funny Mm -hmm. because of their delivery. But you can't have that show without one or the other. Right? There's no replacing the two. So it's more of like a they probably belong more in a conversation of comedy duos than of sketch comedy. They, there's a comedy duo. They had a sketch show. They've mm-hmm. done all this other stuff that's sketch like or, or, or similar, but they belong more in like a, just like key and peel Laurel and Hardy, you know, Abbott and Costello, um, uh, 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 little Britain, 
mm -hmm. um, these comedy duos as like a its own genre. And Mr. Show, while they had a cast, you've got a primary two, right? right. That are clearly the showrunners, the ones that are like calling the shots. If, at least it seems that way, right? Were, the, were they were, were David Cross and Odenkirk the showrunners of Mr. Show? They were. Okay. Yep. And so to me, I think that you kind of are hitting a nail on the head there that it probably, you know, an ensemble that stays together forever. So SNL constantly changing SCTV. They added Martin Short in season two, but right. it was the same group. Um, Feels like a band. Carol Burnett. It's the same group all the time. And they bring in a right. guest every now and then. It is, yeah. Is it a band or is it a franchise? Right. Right. Are you really watching Aerosmith? Or are you watching the remaining Tyler and a couple and, and, and a couple of people who were born after Aerosmith started, right? I actually had a conversation not too long ago about bands that are franchises, right? So you right. take some play uh, you take a band like Foreigner, right? Right. So at one point these guys aren't going to be able to tour anymore. So do you just build a new Foreigner and people love these songs so much and they love this experience that they're willing to go to it over and over? I feel like that's the future of touring music, but I mean, there's yeah a, a lineage of who has inherited the throne, and I think it's it's it would depend on. I mean, every band is going to be different. The culture on every band is different. I think it probably you know Aerosmith probably stops being Aerosmith when Steven Tyler is no longer there, right? Um, in the minds of its fan fans, um, um, and that's I'm sure just true for so many of these bands. But but I don't yeah I don't really know. But in 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 sketch comedy, it's are they a band or are they a franchise? Sure. And SNL is clearly a franchise. Monty Python is clearly a band. Kids in the Hall, band. SCTV, band. Uh, you Upright Citizens Brigade? I mean, as far as what we saw on TV, a band, but yep. they're a franchise, right? Like they're all, they're, they're troops that are going everywhere, just like mm -hmm. Second City, right? Yep. yep. Um, so yeah, then you kind of have to divide kind of divide things out in that way. You know, I also think too, you look at the groups that do live tours too. Mm -hmm. So kids in the hall, I saw them live in the cities. Fantastic live show. Cause they bring their characters out. So the guy who does the, I squish you comes out yep. with a camera and there's a giant screen overhead. So you can, you can be squished. Um, I saw, of course the up, upright systems brigade started as a touring and live show before it moved on to a television right. show. Um, Gosh, who else? I saw I saw David Cross and Bob Odenkirk live when they did their comedy tour, uh, which I didn't enjoy. I did really? that one. Yeah, I was like, I just this one doesn't huh. appeal to me. I saw Tim and Eric live, and you talk about doing something on repeat. They open the show with they both come out wearing top hats and like <laughs> a tuxedo top meant for a child, clear <laughs> clearly, and then these golden shorts that end at the like high part of their thigh and they've got canes and they come out and they're doing this like dance back and forth and it goes on for like 15 minutes. So you can tell they're just making it up at one point. And, and you're like, if they're setting the perfect pace for this live show. So then you've got comedy duos and then you've got the sketch shows that are around a personalities. So you've got Dave Chappelle, the yeah. show. you've got the Ben Stiller show, Dana Carvey show, Carol Burnett show. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that, yeah, that's like, there are, you have to kind of look at the subgenres within sketch comedy right. genres. Why, we haven't talked about the state. Oh my god! How have we not mentioned the state? Yep. yep. I, there are so many listeners, I'm sure, who are just fucking yelling oh, at their I, their iPhones right now, going, "You're not mentioning this group, Auntie Donna. You're not oh, mentioning Auntie god. Donna." But the state, yeah, you can't. Uh, and like I'm breezing over the whitest kids you know, right? And, uh, the birthday boys yeah. and stuff. I don't think like whitest that. kids you know is in the conversation though no. for a greatest of all time. I mean, they're they made some good stuff, but they yeah. just th there's nothing there that would propel them to that level, right? Right. They didn't have the staying power or the like national attention that other things did, right? Right. And I think it's hard to be groundbreaking in sketch comedy. It's sort of right. like trying to be. Uh, you know, a really great pop artist is you, you, one person's going to make it for every 10,000 that uh, put their effort and time into it. I mean, I remember writing sketch comedy for Fargo South High, our end of the mm -hmm. year sketch show confetti and Dustin Buchanan, Jake Harchie and I, I remember sitting and writing and we had three computers in one room. So and this is back when computers were giant honkers. So it was really <laughs> hot. Um. <laughs> Bunch of and, cathode ray tubes. Right. <laughs> and like banging out these sketches one after another. And I remember our drama teacher telling me, like, you've got to stop writing so much. 
because you're not giving everyone else a chance. And so then we were like, okay, that's the key. Hey, like, hey, Byron, come over here. We're going to put Byron in this sketch, and you have to be in a sketch. And so yep. now we're going to get another sketch on the air. Yep. Yep. So yep. I think that uh, I had a lot of fun doing that, but I've learned a lot about sketch writing since. In fact, I'm actually working on a sketch project right now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Like a little thing we're talking about doing this fake sketch show or a, a sketch show about a fake radio station and like going to different. Uh, that's like the through line for it. And it would air like at midnight. Is this like a KFGO specific or is this yeah. line benders? Or? So I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd love for it to be on KFGO. I don't know if KFGO is ready for it. Right. If I'm going to be honest. Right. Uh, but I, it, we did decide that we're not going to podcast it right away. We want it to get on air and then we're going to press it onto vinyl. Oh, you did talk about yeah, that piece. Right? Of, okay. That's right. I remember so, you saying yeah, that. Yeah. And put that out there. And so it's been fun to write some sketches around that. Like we just wrote one about a guy who keeps getting pulled over and over because I had an experience where I got pulled over this last week. <laughs> and uh, it's fun. It's fun to go back to that realm. And Bob Odenkirk, again, another push for comedy, 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 drama. He talks about how they never threw out a sketch. What they would do is if someone came and they wrote a sketch that was a C at best, but it had one good laugh line. They'd say, okay, let's take this laugh line and build it from there. Like, yeah. is the funny premise here that it's a veterinarian who only works on like furries mm -hmm. or is it funny? Because at one point this person's like, yeah, my aunt lives with me, but we're not together. Like what's the, like, and then work out from that. And I had never thought of that because I've thrown away more sketches than I've ever performed. Mm -hmm. But I always am sad because like, you know, there was that one great, part that little premise in it that i really miss and so yeah i'd love a day where i get to do something like that again yeah that'd be fun maybe we should do a, a sketch show at one point on jj meets world i'd Would love to do another there? improv based one yeah we've had done one of those for a long time that'd, yeah, be, a that'd be a good time too. let's get some people in here and do it sweet we'll get some pizza oh okay. i just want there to be pizza, pizza? At that. yeah yeah well you know pizza papa always gets paid <laughs> That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help us continue to produce new episodes each week, visit jjmeetsworld.com, where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some swag at the merch shop, or follow our link to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all the sites the cool kids are using these days. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by visiting moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, check out linebenders.com where you can find direct contact info for JJ or booking information. Tucker, I noticed that when I said Jennifer Lopez, there was a flash in your eyes. Would you care to elaborate? <laughs> <laughs>